right. which is called Do You Hear What I Hear? It's all about listening. There are four parts to the theme, listening to each other, to ourselves, to God, and to creation. Some of the sessions will be slightly longer this time um, than meetings over the past year, but we have fewer topics. We may think about introducing some physical follow-on meetings in between, depending on the appetite to do this, um, but let's just see how it goes. So, listening is not the same as hearing. Hearing is a physical process which happens automatically. Listening is more than that. It requires focus and concentration. If we don't listen attentively, we sometimes hear a different version of what's being said. Earlier this year, the Pope delivered a message from, for the World Day of Social Communications. He noted that people are quickly losing the ability to listen to one another. And he invited us all to listen with the ear of the heart. He said that true listening is a foundation of genuine relationships and foundational to the relationship between God and humanity. Today, we welcome Rose Stokes, a trained teacher and psychodynamic counsellor. Rose has been working with the Diocese of East Anglia, training volunteers for a listening and prayer project, which has just been launched. Most of the training for that ministry has been done online throughout COVID. So Rose is used to the Zoom format. Rose will be giving us some practical tips on listening skills and will allow us time to practice. So listen carefully. We're only able to skim the surface today. So let's see where it takes us and hopefully we'll have some fun as well along the way and a good reflection. So a big welcome to Rose. Thank you, Pauline. Um, and thank you all for, for being here this evening. And I hope that the information I sent you through has, has given you some confidence for the breakout room work. Um, and first of all, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about listening, attentive listening, listening with the heart of the Lord. Um, looking at, first of all, the significance of true attentive listening with the heart of the Lord, how we adapt our mindset to, to accommodate this, the purpose of listening, and then we'll have a look at some of the other skills of listening that I didn't send through to you and have a few more pointers for the, the role play in breakout rooms. So first of all, I start with the significance of listening. So if you like to close your eyes for a moment, you don't have to close your eyes, but if you would like to do that, just close your eyes for a moment and remember a time when you were truly listened to. So just think about who it was who was listening to you, where you were, what you were talking about, and most of all, how did it feel to be truly listened to? How did it feel? Well, attentive listening, you can open your eyes now if you like. Attentive listening is one of the greatest gifts that we can give anyone. When we listen with our whole heart, the experience is transformed into an even deeper connection between persons. 
For people of faith, it's actually a deeply spiritual encounter where we facilitate a personal encounter between the speaker and God through which they can experience greater awareness of the Lord's love for them and his presence with them. When we think about the prayer of St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look out Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless men now. Yours, ours, are the ears which hear. Ours are the mouths which respond to what we have heard. So what is attentive listening all about? Why do, why do we want to do it? To listen more effectively, more compassionately, more lovingly. And as St. Teresa reminded us, we do this in Christian love. We use Christ as our model. Whether we have faith or not, compassionately seeking to meet emotionally and be truly present to the other, to deeply empathize with them and to understand them, to serve them in true humility and humanity. This is a really wonderful endeavor. Of course, listening requires responding appropriately. In all, it demands a real gift of ourself to the other. When we think about the purpose of listening and responding, we're not fixers of people's problems, unless perhaps they, they are a young child. But we listen to validate the person and their feelings. We recognize their feelings, their views, and so on. We don't necessarily agree with them, but attentively listening to the other deeply validates the person and their feelings. Because as a Christian, we see others as an equal child of God. By listening, we provide space and time for the person to express themselves fully, especially their feelings. We provide the opportunity for them to hear what they say, to reflect more on it, to unearth deeper feelings, and so to better understand themselves. And this results in a better ability for them to untangle their issues, to make sense of them and prioritize them. It enables decision-making for any appropriate action that they may wish to take. And truly effective listening and responding avoids dependence on us. It actually creates more self-awareness and it encourages self-reliance and independence. So how do we do all of this? Well, the skills of listening and responding in everyday situations. I'll take you through uh, these now and uh, do this by screen sharing.
So hopefully you can all now um, see the screen. Yeah. And we have a list of skills of listening and responding, which we can use in everyday situations. So first of all, we have creating the listening environment. When we're warm and accepting and empathetic, this creates trust for the person to, to share with us. The deep personal encounter, the gift of self, For the Christian listener, the object is to facilitate a deep personal encounter between the speaker and God, as I said earlier, which produces greater, greater awareness that the Lord is with them and of his love for them. We may not agree with the speaker's actions or attitudes, but our empathy allows us to stand in their shoes, to see and feel things as they do, so that we can lovingly accept them as God does. We have to think of confidentiality. Let's face it, none of us want to open our hearts to a gossip. So the speaker must feel welcomed, accepted, and psychologically and emotionally safe with us if they are to trust us. Attentively listening. Well, the listener says little but keenly listens. The focus is on understanding the speaker, what they say and how they say it, what they don't say, and considering why they don't. Our desire to understand produces empathy, our heartfelt interest and concern for them. Then there's awareness of body language and tone of voice, both the ours and the speakers. We have to consider both. Facial expressions and all other aspects of our physical presence, the position and movement of our head, our hands, arms, legs, feet, etc., where we are placed in relation to one another, the angle of our body whether we're fidgeting. Regardless of the words that we use, body language can say so much more. Similarly, tone of voice conveys a huge amount. Questioning, skepticism, distrust, disapproval, or empathy, understanding compassion, encouragement, above all, the look in our eye needs to be the look of love. Our use of questions. Now often the first thing that people think of when they think of listening is to think of what questions they might ask. Well, we actually need to use questions sparingly. We're not there to interrogate or to satisfy our own curiosity. And we need to not butt in too quickly. We need to think, do I really need to know this in order to understand? Do I need to ask that question in order to understand this person? And what type of questions do we use? Closed questions only require yes or no or one word to answer. For instance, are you sad? 
Yes. No. We may not get much further than that. How are you? When most people are asked how they are, the answer is usually okay, fine, good, thanks. Whether they are okay, fine or good or not. So no detail is elicited by closed questions. And they're fine for facts, such as whether the person is hot or cold, what their age might be, their occupation, etc. But we need to aim to ask open questions to create the opportunity for the speaker to express more about themselves. For instance, not, are you sad? But what are your feelings about this? Can you describe your feelings when that happened? What are the things that you might like to do about this? In what ways do you think you could respond differently to this person? And so on. And there's the use of silence. In addition to not butting in too quickly, which we've mentioned, we need to be patient where there is silence. We need to allow time to make good use of it. Time for the speaker to reflect and consider what and how they wish to say next. Time also for emotions to be felt and understood by them. Don't destroy that experience by thinking that you have an answer or need to rush to comfort or console them and so on. Then we have the three I sent to you an outline, reflecting, paraphrasing and summarising. And just to, to remind you of what those are, reflecting, in reflecting, we use the speaker's words, the actual words that they have used. And this may be just one word, a few words, a full sentence. And the helper chooses the most appropriate tone to suit the purpose and why they are reflecting at that particular point. And the examples that I gave you, gently question, for instance, to encourage elaboration. If somebody says they're frightened, and I just repeat that one word, frightened, so that they can elaborate. They're invited to think about that and elaborate upon that. Maybe give us some an idea of how frightened they are and perhaps why they are frightened. Or we might be subtly affirming by reflecting and repeat the words that they've just used. Felt strong about that so as that they can go into more detail and, and consider, yes, they are, they are feeling strong because of and they themselves um, investigate what they have just said. So reflecting is particularly useful when the speaker is hesitant or when we sense feelings such as confusion, emotional pain and so on which caused them to, to find it difficult to speak, we can gently encourage them to go into more depth. Paraphrasing and summarising are two very similar things, but paraphrasing, is, they're both restating the essence of the speaker's words. Paraphrasing is a mini summary, and, and we use it to check for understanding throughout a conversation. Are we, are we understanding what they have just told us? And it allows for further reflection. It helps the speaker to re reflect further on what they have just said. Summarising, we tend to use at the beginning of, of a conversation to encourage trust. To, to let the person know that we really are interested in what they have to say. And, and that can be when we know something of what they wish to confide in us, some, something that they want to tell us. Um, and, and so this is done on a broader scale than paraphrasing. And we also use it at the ending of a conversation. And it clarifies that we have heard this person and 
it encourages them to, to think clearly about their situation and perhaps consider what they might to do, do next. So I'm just going to stop the, the screen share now. And I'll return to you. <laughs> the wonders of Zoom. Um, and I thought now, with all of that in mind, it is just a very, very quick um, wander through listening, but hopefully, um, between that and the information that, that you had already received, you'll have um, some idea of what you might be doing in the breakout rooms. So, just to, to go over that um, again, <laughs> the, um, the case studies and the goals uh, of... Can you speak to her? Like, Yes. So, sorry, we, we, we've we loved what you said. We've valued your preparation material and it's been super, but we cannot stay with you at this moment. So we're very, very yes, sorry because we've got our own Bible. Because we've got our own Bible. <laughs> so I'm sorry that yes, the clash. But it would thank, be excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. You, you, and thank you for listening. <laughs> well, yeah. that's all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yes, so um, a few more pointers for your, your breakout rooms. First of all, have fun, um, if you possibly can. Just you know, enjoy the experience. It's, you've only got a short uh, little a bit time to, to do a little bit of practice. Um, so I think, um, Pauline, that people are going to be in groups of four, actually, mainly in groups of four. Um, so you'll probably have two observers and um, you can either decide between yourselves who's going to be speaker, listener, and the observers, or um, if that's taking too long, you could decide alphabetically using your Christian name, using your first name, who is going to be the speaker, the listener, and the observer. But either way, as long as you can you know, get it done fairly quickly and it can give you a little bit of time to, to practice. Um, so there may be some size of relief now from anybody called Zoe, if there's a Zoe amongst you that thinks, oh, well, you know, yes, they're going to be the, the observer. However, Zoe, I'm afraid you will need to be prepared to feed back to the main group. So there's, there's no um, winners in, in this one, whichever way you do it. Um, the, the observers also, if you could um, be the timekeepers, so you'll probably have about 25 minutes. Um, I think, Pauline, people need to be back at 7.25. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So, so we're coming up to we're five to seven now, so about half an hour from, from now. So if you divide your time, um, more or less, maybe 15 minutes to speak, and about 10 minutes for, for your own feedback in your uh, groups. And um, the observer's feedback to both the speaker and, and listener, the notes I sent you out, you'd be positive, tentative if you're making some suggestions, and um, keep it personal. Um, I felt this because somebody else might feel something different. And it's always a lovely, gentle, empathetic way to, to say something. Um, and when in feedback to the whole group, just one or two points to, to consider, that would, that would be great. The speaker, um, yeah, feel free to choose any of the three suggestions given to you, or if you want to create your own fictional scenario, that's, that's entirely up to you. You can be hesitant, chatty, nervous, angry, despondent, whatever you, you like, and you can imagine whatever detail you like. This is, this is completely yours to do with as you like, and there is an Oscar at stake here. So, you know, the best of, of, of the lot is an Oscar. Um, the listener, you are not a fixer. You do not have to fix the speaker's problems. You are there to listen. Um, 
you're possibly more likely to suggest possible solutions if somebody decides to be the teenager as the speaker. But your aim really is to encourage talk and explanation of issues and feelings in order to clarify, for the, for the speaker to clarify their mind so that they discover their own way forward. Um, so we don't listen in order to, to, to solve and produce the solutions. And I was talking only a couple of days ago to um, a deputy head teacher who said he didn't know I was involved in this sort of, of work at all, but he happened to say to me that he was listening to, to one of his students who was in, in a pretty poor way, pretty serious situation. And at the end of listening to him, he said to the student, now, what can I do for you? And the student said, sir, you've done it all. You've already done it. And that was it. It had allowed the student the time to clarify, to understand things, to understand himself better. The listening was enough on its own. So we, we needn't rush into trying to solve the other person's problems. Um, so I think with that, um, Pauline, we're ready to be for the breakout rooms if you want. Yes. yes. Um, I think Maurice, Maurice, were you, were you going to do that? What, what would you like? I think, I think we'll stop the recording now. Okay.